Hey, thanks for being here this morning. If you are new, just again, we want to welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. I'd love a chance to meet you after service. Uh, we're going to continue our Gospel of Mark sermon series today. We've been working verse by verse through this book. We are coming up on part 34 today. So go ahead and turn to chapter 9, verse 38. And last week we saw that Jesus stops in Galilee where he did most of his ministry in the first part of Mark. He, he stops there one more time before he heads to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And on the way there, he reminds his disciples yet again of his mission, what he came to do. He didn't come to take down Rome. He needed to keep telling them this. I didn't come to take down Rome and set up an earthly kingdom, but I came to die and rise again. Before he could have victory, he had to die first. That's what Jesus is trying to get into their bones, that, hey, I'm going to die, and then I'll rise again. And after this, somehow the disciples yet again get into a conversation that just is totally messed up in a number of different ways. But this conversation is about who's the greatest, okay? Who's the greatest in God's kingdom? And Jesus takes this opportunity to teach them that, that true greatness is not found through achievement. Jesus says, what you've heard about greatness, that, that's not the truth. It's not found through achievement. It's not found through pursuing your own pleasure, your own desires, but greatness is found in serving others. And he uses a child to, or to illustrate that, that greatness is found in serving the least of these in society. The truly great ones, the greatest people on earth are those who serve those who can't give them anything in return. Okay, so following that teaching, we get to verse 38, which is where we're going to be at today. And a couple of things that you just need to understand before we dive into this. The first thing is this passage is really connected to last week's passage. It could have been one sermon put the two passages together. And honestly, I had a really tough time figuring out where to cut last week's message off and start this one. So they are very connected. So if you were here, keep last week's message in mind. The second thing to know is that it appears to be the only time in the Gospel of Mark where Mark has put together sayings from different contexts or from various times in Jesus' ministry and put them all into one unit. It seems like they're happening sequentially, but they're probably not. They're, they're more organized by theme, okay? So ancient historians, they weren't like modern historians. They would often organize their material uh, not by sequence, not by when they happen, but by theme. And that's what Mark appears to be doing here. And Tom Wright, he's a great New Testament scholar. He says this about this passage. He's trying to tell us what the theme of the passage is, because I think we need to know the theme before we hide or jump in. So he says this. He says, this is the one part of Mark's gospel where it seems to me very likely that Mark is collected together and edited sayings from completely different contexts. Even if that's the case, we should assume that he has something in mind as an overall theme. In other words, he has a reason why he put these, these sayings together. And it, and Tom thinks that the idea of a battle now being joined with serious consequences fits the bill. So what he's saying is that the best theme for our text is the idea, or his best guess at a theme for our text, is the idea that there's a spiritual battle, and that battle has serious consequences for how we live. Okay, so as we read that passage, kind of think of that as we're going through it. Read it through that lens. As they head towards Jerusalem... Jesus and his disciples are headed into a spiritual battle, and they need to understand a few principles if they're going to win this battle. Okay, so it says this in verse 38. Let's jump in. It says, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for one who does a mighty work, or for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who's not against us is for us, for truly I say to you, Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Encouraging word this morning. Keeps going. Verse 13. It gets better. Are you ready? It says, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And then verse 44 is actually removed from modern translation. So is verse 46 because they are just repeating what verse 48 says. But not just that. More significantly, they are, are not in the original manuscripts. Okay, so as we have gotten older manuscripts, we see that, that this, or verse 44 and 46 were not in those original manuscripts. So we have taken them out of modern translations. That happens sometimes where when the Bible was first put together, they thought they were part of the original manuscripts, and we found that they're not. Okay, so just so you know why we're skipping it. All right, verse 45. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. 
It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their warm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Okay, again, that's the one that was in 44 and 46. In 49, it says, For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Okay, so the title of the sermon is Salt in Hell. No, I'm kidding, it's not that. It's Total Commitment. You can throw it up on the screen. <laughs> total Commitment. That's the title of the sermon. All right, let's jump in. You're like, man, he's getting real bad with the sermon titles. All right, let's pray. Uh, Jesus, we thank you so much for this encouraging word this morning. I'm just kidding. But Lord, we thank you for the word. And God, we pray that it would speak. God, we pray that, that this morning would not just be us doing church or just trying to learn a few new things. But God, I pray that this would be a demonstration of your spirit's power. I pray that nothing would be done out of striving. But God, that this would just be your spirit moving through this word. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So when I was in middle school, my mom signed me up for piano lessons. I swear I took like every type of lesson you could take. She even, well, this is fine if you do this as a guy, but she put me in cheerleading when I was in elementary and there's no guys there. So I ran out of the gym, but that's a side note. She put me in the piano lessons in middle school. At first I was super excited. That's another story for another sermon. I promise I'll share it. But, but I was super excited and I practiced at first. I was like, I'm going to learn piano. I did everything that the teacher told me to do. I was like the ideal student for about two weeks and then I stopped practicing and I started to just do the bare minimum of what she asked me to do right before my lesson. I would kind of like, you know, try to figure it out so I didn't look like an idiot. And eventually my teacher fired me. She got so fed up that she told my mom that she was done giving me instruction. It wasn't just me. She cut off a lot of students. But point is, I was one of the students who got downsized. I did not make the cut. And today I still can't really play piano. I can play a few chords. But that's about it. I look back on that and I regret it a little bit. If I had only been a little more committed, I could have learned a really valuable skill. You know, when dinner parties are happening, I could jump on the piano and just start like jamming. But no, that doesn't happen because I didn't get committed to learning the piano when I had the opportunity. I think one of the great struggles today in the American church is commitment. We really, and that's not just in the church, it's in the world, but I, but I think in the American church specifically, we really struggle with commitment. We struggle with committing personally first to Jesus, so being committed to him. We struggle with or walking away from things that cause us to sin. We, we kind of let them hang out in our lives for far too long. Uh, we struggle with spending time with Jesus each day. It's a real drag for us. We struggle with giving the Lord our tithe and our offerings. We struggle with making spiritual activities a priority. We struggle with letting Jesus into every area of our lives. We kind of keep him in a compartment, but we don't let him into all of our lives. We kind of keep Jesus at arm's distance. We say, okay, you stay there. Like, you do you. I'm going to do me. You stay right there, Jesus. And we may let him into part of our lives, but not our entire lives. And I, th I think that this stems from a lack of trust that Jesus has good intentions for our lives and that his way is the best way. I think, that's, I think the problem is we don't really know Jesus and his character because if we knew him, if we really, really knew him and understood his love and his goodness, we would want him in every area. I think we also struggle with committing ourselves to the local church. We struggle to commit ourselves to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We struggle with making church attendance a priority. We struggle with developing relationships with our brothers and sisters outside of church. Uh, we struggle with committing to one local church. We struggle with loving those within the church, especially those who are different than us. Like, if that person doesn't make me feel good, I, I struggle to love them. Uh, we struggle with serving others in the body and so forth. And I think for this one, I think part of it, I think a lot of it has to do with church hurt. We're afraid of being hurt by the church. Maybe we've been hurt by the church before, and we're trying to protect ourselves. I think another part of it could just be apathy. We're just lazy. So it's really hard to commit to community. It's hard to be there for others. So we just choose not to. We choose to kind of do an isolated faith. And, and regardless of the reason, it's safe to say that generally speaking, okay, so I know this doesn't apply to everybody, but, but generally speaking, we struggle with committing to Jesus and his church. It's a huge problem right now. We struggle with it. I believe that the Lord wants to do something really significant in our generation. I believe he has a purpose for these days. I believe that, that the word we use in the church uh, would be revival. I believe that God wants to kind of breathe on our generation and, and raise up passionate sons and daughters of the faith. Uh, but for that to happen, we have to get committed to Jesus and his church. That's the way. It's always been through Jesus and his church. We have to commit to his body. We have to commit to him. And Mark shows us what it looks like to be committed in this passage. He, he gives us a few lessons. So I just want to kind of go verse by verse and just see what he says about 
commitment. So the first thing is in verse 38 through 40. It's when John says, hey, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus says, do not stop him, for, one who, or for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who's not against us is for us. Okay, so to understand what's happening here, we have to think about the context. Okay, so a few weeks ago, John was on a mountain, on a mountain with Jesus, when or with only two other disciples, and he got to see the very glory of God. If you see the glory of God, it might make you get a big head if you don't handle it in the right way. Okay, so then he gets into a conversation last week about who's the greatest disciple. It appears that John might be getting a little bit of an ego. Okay, so now he's like trying to stop someone from casting out a demon in Jesus' name. Why? Because he's not following us. Us. That's important. He complains that this exorcist was not following us, as in Jesus and the 12 disciples. I think it's a little arrogant of him at this point in his journey to think that he's worthy of being followed. He should have said he's not following you to Jesus, but, but he wasn't really, the thing is that exorcist was casting the demons out in Jesus' name, so that wasn't the problem. The problem was that that guy wasn't hanging out with that specific crew, with that inner circle. John's like, hey, he's not a, a part of us. How dare he go cast out demons in your name? And what's especially ironic about this is the disciples had just failed to cast out a demon earlier in chapter 9. They'd failed at it. This guy's doing it right. And then John's like, hey, stop him, Jesus. It's crazy. (laughs) It's funny the humanity of the disciples, right? We could all see ourselves in that situation, I think. John is completely disregarding what Jesus said about greatness. He's not interested in serving others, including others, but he wants to exclude them. He wants to restrict Jesus' ministry to his inner circle. And Jesus surprises John when he says, you should not prohibit the exorcist. Jesus seems to believe that that no one can do a miracle in his name in one moment or can't easily do a miracle in his name in one moment and then come against him in the next. Okay, so if someone's doing a miracle in Jesus' name, Jesus seems to think that they must be empowered by God and they won't be able to easily walk away from him. Jesus does not want the disciples to be suspicious and exclusive towards those who are bearing genuine fruit in his name. Okay, so if we go back to the imagery that I talked about of us being in a spiritual battle, Jesus appears to be saying that we need all hands on deck in this battle. During wartime, you don't have time to fight with those who are on your side. You don't have time to fight with your allies. A war is on, and people are taking sides, and we need to welcome those who take the side of Jesus. We do not have time to be divided amongst ourselves. We don't have time. I think about, like, when church, and we've never had this issue yet. We're a young church. But when churches get into fights about the carpet color, that just brings so much glory to Satan, right? They're, like, arguing, wrestling over the carpet cover, or color. Like, come on. Right? That's what Satan wants. He wants to distract us from what the actual mission is. We don't need to be divided amongst ourselves. We need to be focused on the mission to go and reach people and help them become fully devoted followers of Jesus. John's attitude is something that the church still struggles with today. Okay, we're often tempted to turn our noses up to other churches or denominations that have minor differences from us in style or strategy or secondary doctrines. And we assume that the true church, the true way of doing things belongs to us. Obviously, if someone's claiming to be a Christian and they're teaching unbiblical truths, they're, they're teaching false teaching, then we should be divided over that, right? Like the gospel and those uh, types of things. We will die on that hill, right? We're not just going to ha- have unity when people are teaching a false gospel. But if they're preaching Jesus and they're upholding the scriptures, we should cheer them on. We should be the biggest fans of other churches in our city. We need the various streams of the church to accomplish the Great Commission. The Great Commission is huge. Even here in the Cedar Valley, there's 100,000 people. It is huge. We can't do it on our own. We need the other streams of the church in our community to be able to accomplish the Great Commission. And that's not just because there's lots of people. It's also because different types of churches reach different types of people. That's the reality. I realize that Scent Church is not the church for every person in the Cedar Valley. It's just not. We reach a specific kind of person, and other churches will reach other types of people. We need all the different flavors, and streams to be able to reach all the different flavors and types of people. We need all the churches of the Cedar Valley. We must celebrate them and be so excited about what God is doing through them. The mission is too urgent, and time is too short for us to fight amongst ourselves or spend any energy criticizing another church. Okay, so the first thing I want you to get this morning is we must be committed to the discipleship of our fellow 
No, that's the second point. We must be committed to celebrating disciples from all streams of the church. We must be committed to celebrating disciples from all streams of the church. I think we'll get that up there in a second. So that's the first point. I'll say it again so you can write it down. We must be committed to celebrating disciples from all streams of the church. Okay, so this doesn't mean we have to be one big church organizationally, okay? That's not practical. Or that we have to be intimate with every other Christian in our city. That's not possible. It's not prudent. But it means that that we should love and welcome and celebrate believers regardless of tribe or denomination. We are committed spiritually and in unity to all our brothers and sisters in Christ here and around the world. And this also applies to how we operate within our church. We must celebrate one another regardless of our differences. We should not allow age or race or gender, background, socioeconomic status, or anything to divide the church. We are a church that celebrates and welcomes one another, even in the midst of our differences. The mission, again, is too urgent for us, and the blood of Jesus too strong to be divided over these sorts of things. Okay, so when I was in elementary school and middle school, I played baseball, and I had this bitter rivalry with other baseball players in my school, because we were all on different teams. We were all on uh, different teams in uh, like, like U-Triple-S-A or whatever it was called, or the Little League. And for years, I didn't have friendship with some of those kids because they played on the other teams. And then when we got to high school, we were all on the same team. I'm like, this is really awkward. We've been fighting for years. Now we're supposed to be on the same team. And I hadn't, or I didn't have, yeah, there's the point. But I didn't have friendships with them because they're on other teams. I'd been, been really weird and insecure. And then I realized as I played with them, like, these guys are awesome. They're really nice. They're really good ball players. I love these guys. And we ended up becoming friends in high school. I ended up really enjoying those other kids and building strong friendships with them. I regret, still to this day, and I was a child, but I regret treating them as the enemy before that. It was just silly. The same applies to our relationship with other believers in this church and in other churches. We are on one team. When we get to heaven, we'll all have the same jersey on. We should not be concerned about being better than others, but should seek to serve one another. Okay, so this leads me to the next part of the text in verse 41. It says this, For truly I say to you that whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Okay, so Jesus goes on to tell us that there's a special reward for those who care for his disciples. At the same time, there's punishment for those who cause his little ones. He's not talking about kids here. He's talking about disciples. His little ones to sin. If we return to our image of being in a battle, it seems that Jesus is telling us that we have to watch out for our fellow soldiers and we should have their backs. We have to have their backs. We must be committed. This is the second one. We must be committed to the discipleship of our fellow disciples. We must be committed to the discipleship of our fellow disciples. We have a responsibility. There's a responsibility on our lives to our brothers and sisters in Christ especially those who you've committed to be in the same body with, the same local church with. There's a responsibility there. We must look out for them. Okay, there's two parts to this. The first piece is seen in verse 41 where he uses the image of giving a cup of cold water. What's he mean by that? Well, he's saying we should be committed to caring for one another. We have to care for one another's needs. We care for one another. There's a special reward for those who care for disciples. We should love one another. We should meet each other's needs. We should be gentle with one another. We should nurture one another, help each other when we fall. On the other hand, we should take great care that we don't cause a brother or sister in Christ to sin. We should consider our personal responsibility to help protect our brothers and sisters in Christ and help lead them into holiness. He says, if you cause someone to sin, it's better that you get a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea, I think it's pretty important that we protect one another. Jesus says that this is of primary importance. And this seems to be connected to, to John and Jesus' conversation about the other exorcists, if, if he could keep doing that in his name. John was causing the other exorcists to stumble by trying to exclude them. He's calling out John here, saying, you're causing them to stumble. And, Instead of excluding them, you should want to encourage them and bring them into community. We must not do anything that causes a brother or sister in Christ to stumble, but should seek to protect each other. We're in a battle, and we got to have each other's backs. At the same time, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and protecting our own holiness. He gets at this in verse 43. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands 
to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Okay, so Jesus is getting a little intense here. All right, if you think my sermons are intense, just look at Jesus' sermons, right? This is intense. We, he's saying we should cut off body parts to be holy. Okay, so, so when he says this, he's not being literal. Okay, so we're not going to start an arm cutting off station in the back of the church. It's, he's not being literal. He's using hyperbole to make a point. It's a metaphor. It's a hyperbole. He's saying we should seek to root things out of our hearts and lives that cause us to sin or lead us to sin and, and can push us further from Christ. In this context, it appears that Jesus is thinking of John and the other disciples, because we don't want to just pick on John, but, but I think he's thinking of their desire to be great in a worldly sense, their pride. Their desire to be better than others and to have all this honor continues to cause them to sin. Jesus appears to be worried that they could disqualify themselves from being a disciple by being so concerned with their own personal greatness. He's saying, deal with this before it's too late. Cut that desire off. But this, here's the thing, this doesn't only include obviously sinful things, but it includes even good things that can pull us from Christ, right? Body parts are good. The Bible affirms the body. On the last day, all bodies will be raised up to be resurrected and be with Christ forever for those who trust in him and, and those who don't to go to hell. But the point is, bodies are good. Body parts are good, God-given gifts. But Jesus uses this drastic imagery of cutting them off to show the worth and importance of God's kingdom. He's saying the body's very important, but God's kingdom is even more important. He says, don't let anything into your life that repeatedly causes you to sin. It's better that we lose good things that cause us to sin than to be thrown into hell. The Greek word for hell here is Gehenna, which was actually a real place. It was in the Hinnom Valley, southwest of Jerusalem. It's in a valley, and it was the place where the Israelites would sacrifice infants in the Old Testament. They had this, this practice of sacrificing children to pagan gods in the Old Testament. And the prophet Jeremiah, in his book, in his prophetic book, he decries that practice. He, he speaks boldly against it. He rebukes it. And then King Josiah abolished the practice. But after that, because of all the terrible things that had been done in that valley, they made it into a garbage dump. And it burned with fire constantly. It was a nasty place. So Jesus uses this real physical place as a symbol of what divine wrath and punishment will be like for those who do not trust in him. He's saying, you don't want to go to hell. You don't want to go to Gehenna. It's not a nice place. It's a place where the fire will never go out. It's, it's better to, to cut off a body part than to go there. It's not a good place. And, and Jesus, what he's doing is he's, he's stressing the importance of holiness and purity. While Jesus certainly covers our sin through his sacrifice, hear me this morning. He covers our sin through his sacrifice. If you trust in him, you can have complete confidence that he, he covers it. At the same time that that's true, we should not be careless with sin. We should not trifle with it. It kills. It's destructive. It can lead us down a path that we don't want to go. We must seek to not only, hear me, we must seek to not only be forgiven of our sins, but freed from our sins. It can destroy us from the inside out. Our eternities are determined by the decisions we make today. Our eternities are determined by the decisions we make today. If we're headed towards hell, we need to make course corrections before it's too late. There will be a day when we can no longer call on the name of Jesus when we have died and the end has come. We must surrender to Jesus. We must surrender to Jesus and accept his sacrifice on our behalf. And then we should let him into every area of our life so we can get free of sin's hold. Okay, so, so with that said, we must be committed to our own discipleship. So not just the discipleship of our brothers and sisters, but to our own discipleship. It needs to be of primary importance. Jesus is advocating for an all-in type of discipleship here. Instead of just attending church once in a while, doing the bare minimum and trying to be a good person, he's saying, you're saying your relationship with me should be your all-consuming passion. It's the most important thing in your life, 
and everything you do should revolve around it. Jesus will not have a compartmentalized Christianity. We should not seek to see how close we can get to sin, but should try to get as far away as possible from it. Again, it's destructive. It's like getting close to something that could poison you or kill you. And again, we, we don't do this to get into heaven. Hear me this morning. Salvation is only found through the grace of God and the blood of Jesus. It's only found through his sacrifice. Nothing you do is going to earn salvation. Even your most righteous deeds are filthy rags to God. Nothing you do can earn salvation. We don't get as far away from sin as possible to get into heaven, but as a response to God's love. It's a response. It's a response to the fact that he's already forgiven us, and we don't want to trifle with that. We don't want to mess with that anymore. It can kill us. We don't want to mess with it. Psalm 63 tells us that the steadfast love of God is better than life. It's better than life. You can get all the stuff in the world, get all your dreams, all your greatest desires. And David says the steadfast love of God is better than that. It's the best thing in the world. And when you truly encounter the steadfast love of God, you can't help but respond to it by giving Jesus your entire life. You can't help but say, Jesus, you have it all. You have everything. You can't help but do that. But not just that. We don't just live according to God's way, because we're responding, but also because it's the best way to live. God is smarter than us. He designed us. He wired us. He knows how we're supposed to live. We should live into his will because it's the best way to live. James Edwards says this. He says, as, a, as important as eyes, hands, and feet are to us, or whatever else claims ultimate allegiance, they are ultimate allegiance. They are not life. Hear this. The kingdom of God is life. And nothing, nothing in this life should be allowed to prevent one from entering the kingdom. The choice is literally between God's kingdom and the fire that never goes out. Okay, so let me ask you this this morning. Are you taking radical ownership of your own discipleship or have you delegated that to other people? Have you delegated that to a spiritual leader or to a pastor or to a friend? Or are you taking responsibility for your discipleship? Are you doing whatever it takes to be holy? As much as we're called to be committed to one another, at the end of the day, no one else can be primarily responsible for your discipleship than you. You have to take responsibility for it. I learned the importance of ownership, so this kind of ownership, this, this taking responsibility. I learned the importance of this in the fourth grade. Okay, my family was having a barbecue at our house with some friends, and my older brothers built a bike ramp. I already wasn't a very good bicyclist, but they built a ramp, and it's like one of those that you like hop over, and then there's like a gap here. I don't know why they did that to me. And then there's another side that you land on. Okay, they built this, this ramp. And to successfully clear the ramp, you need to pull up on the handlebars, right? Most people would know that logically. Like you can't just run the tire into the other ramp. You're going to fall over. But for me, I was in fourth grade, and I was so tentative when it came to risky activities like this. But something, I don't know because I don't remember, but something possessed me to give it a try. Again, I've lost all memory of the, of the event because what happened next, or because I blacked out, the point is. So the point is, what happened next was I went to jump the ramp, and supposedly I didn't pull up on the handlebars, and I just beefed it and then hit my face. And for the next 12 hours, I blacked out. I had a really bad concussion. I went to the hospital. I was unable to remember even the most basic details about my life. My parents went to bed that night pretty afraid. But when I woke up in the morning, all my memories came back to me, praise God. Uh, besides what happened that day. I, I could not remember anything that happened that day. Although I don't know exactly what, or what went through my mind when I jumped that ramp, I know myself, and I know myself at that time of my life, I would get very nervous about things. I would become tentative, and I wouldn't take full ownership. I'd kind of just close my eyes and hope it works out. I would just kind of freeze in moments like that. I'm guessing that's what happened when I jumped the ramp. I was just so pumped that I actually had the courage to do it. I'm like, hey, close your eyes now. It'll all work out. And then beefed it. I was brave enough to try it, but too tentative to take full ownership of the bike and pull up on the handlebars when I needed to. I only took partial ownership of the jump, and it led to drastic consequences. This lack of ownership, again, over what I was doing, led to drastic consequences. And I think the same is true in our spiritual lives. If we fail to be all in, if we fail to be fully committed to our discipleship, we will crash and burn. The discipleship that the world is trying to give us, you know, to be discipled into the ways of the world is too strong for us to be half in and think it's going to work out. Discipleship, hear me, discipleship, becoming like Jesus, it can't happen unless you're all in it, unless you're willing to sacrifice and you're fully committed. Okay, so Jesus makes this more clear at the end of his passage. He says, for everyone will be salted with fire, 
Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. The best way to understand these verses is to read them with the, the backdrop of the Old Testament temple sacrifice in mind, the temple sacrifice, where in temple sacrifices, salt and fire played key roles. Uh, the offerings had to be totally consumed by fire to be acceptable, and salt was a sign of the covenant and was required to accompany the sacrifices. Okay, so it appears that Jesus is using fire and salt to symbolize the sacrifice required in discipleship. Everyone will be salted with fire, the, the sacrifice required in discipleship. So to be his disciple, you must be totally and utterly committed to him. James Edwards says this, discipleship to Jesus lays a total claim on one's life. In the language of sacrifice, it must be totally consuming or it's worthless. Okay, so another way to think about this is to think about salt as a preservative. In the ancient world, salt kept food from going bad. If disciples lose their saltiness, they would fail to be true disciples and wouldn't be able to infect the world with the light of Jesus. They needed to stay salty. Okay, not in a grumpy way, not like you're feisty. Stay salty, though, in a discipleship way. And part of that is being at peace with each other. Our relationship with, our relationship with one another is intimately connected to our relationship with God. If you love God, you're going to love people made in his image, right? If you love the Lord, if you love Jesus, you're going to love his bride. If you love the head of the body of Christ, you're going to love the body of Christ, right? You need to be at peace with one another. And this brings our passage full, or full circle. Jesus is stressing the importance, again here, of looking out and loving your fellow disciples. Okay, so here's the thing. We are in a spiritual war, not against people, but against the devil and his minions. The devil is on the prowl, and he wants to devour people. He wants to kill people. He wants to tear it all down. He wants to take as many people as possible to hell. If we take it easy, or if we just try to play it safe, or we just try to live an easy life, the most comfortable life possible, we're going to get devoured. We must be, hear me, we must be totally committed to our discipleship and to the discipleship of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We must be totally committed to Jesus and his church. Discipleship requires total commitment to Jesus and his church. With that in mind, the question remains, how can we be totally committed? Do we just grunt a little bit, like, I'm committed now? Or do we just try harder? Just like we work it up, like, I'm going to be committed now, yeah. Or is there more to it than that? I want to propose that if we want to be totally committed, we need a revelation. We need a revelation this morning. We must have a revelation of Jesus' total commitment. The only way we're going to be able to be totally committed to Jesus is if we see his total commitment. We need his example to stir us. All of the Christian life, we've been talking about this this morning, all of the Christian life is a response to Jesus. We love because he first loved us. And we see this in the disciples' lives. We see the transformation as they experience Jesus' love, how they changed. Okay, so before Jesus went to the cross, the disciples all bailed on Jesus. Like Peter's like, I'll never deny you. Five minutes later, he's denying Jesus three times. But after the cross and the resurrection, all of a sudden, the disciples had the ability to give it all for Jesus. What changed? What was the difference? I think there's a few things, but, but the difference was they got a, got a revelation of Jesus' total commitment to them on the cross and in the resurrection. And they were also filled with the Holy Spirit. That was another thing that happened. If we want to be totally committed, we need a revelation of the love of God. We need to allow the total commitment of Jesus to move us. He's not asking us to do something that he hasn't done. In light of our text today, I think we see two things about Jesus' total commitment. The first thing is Jesus was totally committed to those who were not of his tribe. While we were still sinful and headed to hell, while we were not his people, Jesus Christ came out of heaven to rescue us says this in Romans 9. I love this verse. It says, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. Jesus came for us when we did not deserve him. He loved us and made us his people when we weren't his people. He, he called us beloved when we didn't deserve his love. You know, Romans 5.8 goes as far to tell us that, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus did not and does not go halfway in his saving of us. 
He didn't leave us to fend for ourselves, but he did whatever it took to reconcile us back to God. He gave us the ultimate example of what it means to care for and to protect others, even at great personal cost to himself. The second thing we need to get about his total commitment is he was totally committed to his calling. Jesus resolved to do things in God's way and in God's timing. We see this vividly in what happened just before he was betrayed and crucified. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays to God right before he's crucified. It says this, he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, the cup of suffering, the cup of the sacrifice on the cross, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Although Jesus was not surely excited about his coming suffering, he submitted himself to the Father's will. He took radical responsibility for his call and his mission. He didn't try to run from it. Jesus was willing to do whatever it took to complete the mission that God had given him. He even gave up his body on a tree for us. Jesus lived out, again, he practices what he preaches. He lived out the call to cut off body parts to fulfill your calling. He practiced it. He gave up his very body so that he could fulfill his mission and so we could be saved. He doesn't ask us to do things that he doesn't do himself. The only way we're gonna be able to be totally committed to Jesus is if we realize that he is radically committed to us. Even on our worst days, he's committed to you. He loves you even at your very worst. Again, we love because he first loved us. Everything we do is a response to him. Okay, the main idea this morning is this. If we're to win our spiritual war, we must be totally committed to Jesus and his church. In Mark Batterson's book, All In, he tells the story of a missionary named A.W. Milne, and he was one of several missionaries from a century ago who were known as the one-way missionaries. Okay, so they would purchase single tickets to the mission field without a return trip. And instead of bringing suitcases, they packed their few belongings into coffins. As they sailed out, out of the port, they would wave goodbye to everything they knew, to everyone they loved, and they knew that they would never come home. A.W., he set sail for the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, and he knew full well that that what awaited him there was headhunters who had killed every missionary that had ever tried to come to to their tribe. But he did not fear for his life because he already died to himself. He had already died with Christ. He had already given up everything to Jesus. So he wasn't fearing losing his earthly life because he had already died with Christ. His coffin was packed. And he ended up spending 35 years with those people. And he ministered among the tribe. He loved them as his own. And when he died, the tribe members buried him in the middle of the village and they inscribed this on his tombstone. It says this, when he came, there was no light. And when he left, there was no darkness. His total commitment to Jesus led to the salvation of an entire people and impacted generations. Okay, so let me ask you this morning, are you totally committed to Jesus? Does he have full leadership over your hands and your eyes and your feet? Do you invite him into every area of your life? Does he have leadership over your sex life, over your finances, your work life, your family life, your emotional life? Or is there something in your life that's causing you to stumble? Do you need to cut something off or rearrange something this morning? At the same time, are you committed to Jesus' bride? Are you committed to his church? Do you prioritize your church family? Whether that's here or somewhere else, do you prioritize that? Do you take responsibility for the care and protection of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you give a cold cup of water to your fellow disciples when they need it? Do you ensure that that you're setting a good example and you're not causing other people to stumble? Or do you act like one person when you're at church and someone else when you're alone? Like, are you the real deal? Are you ensuring that you don't cause people to stumble by what you allow into your life? Or are you doing a solo faith? that has no regard for other disciples, that has no regard for other brothers and sisters in Christ, you're only concerned about yourself. If you're struggling this morning to follow Jesus or you're struggling to take responsibility for other people, you need to come face to face with the total commitment of Jesus this morning. Get a revelation of who Jesus is. 
When you were not of his tribe, he came after you. When you were not lovely, he made you lovely. When you weren't his people, he said, you're my people. When you were helpless and couldn't do anything for him, he took responsibility for you. When he could have taken the easy way out, he took ownership of his mission and calling and he pressed forward in the midst of trial. We must be a church that is undone by his example. That's the only way we're gonna live into the calling that he has for us is if we are just so in love with him, we've been so moved by him. We must allow his example of total commitment to stir us to be totally committed to him and his church, not because we're trying to prove something, not because we're trying to earn something. We're not trying to prove that we're spiritual or something like that. Instead, we just are so in love with him. We're so in love with Jesus. We just can't help but respond in that way. Here's the thing, if we can be totally committed, we will see transformation first in our own lives. Like when you just say, I'm done being half and half out, I'm all in, Jesus starts to transform every area and it's beautiful. So that's gonna happen first. But also we're gonna see captives set free in the Cedar Valley. We're gonna see the gates of hell pushed back. We're gonna just walk into opportunities where God gives us a chance to show his love to people. And we will see the Cedar Valley become a little bit more like heaven. We'll see our neighborhoods become a little bit more like heaven. Our families become a little bit more like heaven. Our homes become a little bit more like heaven. Our hearts become a little bit more like heaven. We'll see that happen, but it starts with a commitment. Say, I'm following Jesus. I'm not turning back. I'm all in. All right, let's stand to our feet. We're gonna just respond in, in a time of worship here this morning. We can bring the lights down. And I really just want you to lean in for these last few moments of service. Let Jesus love you. Let Jesus love you this morning. Let him love you. Don't think about all the things you gotta do better, how you gotta try harder. Let him love you. Obviously repent of your sins, get right with him, but let him love you this morning. Let him tell you what he thinks about you because I think you'll be surprised. All right, so I just wanna pray. I just wanna just respond to God here and then I'm gonna open the altars up. The prayer team's gonna be up here. They're gonna be available. So prayer team can come now actually, but yeah, altars are open. Let's just experience his love. Let's just kind of sit in it for these last few moments. I'm just gonna pray. You pray in your heart as I pray. So Jesus, right now we come to you and Lord, we need a revelation of your love. Lord, we need a revelation this morning. Jesus, I pray that you give us a, a, a fuller understanding of who you are. Lord, I pray for visions all across this room that, that you put pictures in people's minds, just, just kind of revealing to them how much you love them. God, I pray that you would speak words of encouragement across this room to people. God, I pray that, that for those things that are separating us from you, those things that are causing us to sin, I, I pray that you would reveal those things in a loving and gentle way, just like you do, and show us how to rearrange our lives so that we can walk in greater holiness. God, I pray that you would show us the people we're supposed to love in this church and in this community. Lord, give us a revelation of your love this morning. We love you, in Jesus' name, amen.